From the prophets of Baal who challenged Elijah at Mount Carmel to the modern day cult leaders of Jim Jones or David Koresh, the world has known a lot of false prophets, a lot of uh, people, false teachers. The Bible says that there will be many more that will come. And we'll see today in our Bible message where Satan will empower a false prophet to deceive the world into worshiping the Antichrist. To show you how close we are to the coming of Christ, we are in the midst of the formation of a one world religion. That's where we're moving to. We're moving to it very quickly. We're seeing it before our eyes. We're living in that time to where this is taking place. Last week we spoke about the political system uh, that the state holds total authority over the society. We're talking about a one world government that is going to come on the scenes. Today we will speak about the one world religion. There is a certain element of truth in Karl Marx's quoted statement that religion is the opium of the people. Because I will tell you that people are incurably religious. They are because God created them to be worshipers. That's the way God created us to be people of worship. People will inevitably worship someone or something. If it's not the true God, then they will, they will worship false gods of their own making. As we see, as we have seen down through the years and we continue to see uh, people do. Because false religion is so much a part of this fallen world, it's no surprise that false religion will play a major role in the end times. During the tribulation, all the world's diverse false religions are going to be united into one world religion. God's people across America, you included today, you will tell me so that we are all deeply disturbed and concerned about the drift of our country away from the Judeo-Christian foundation. We're all concerned about that today. I heard one of our military veterans on television, I think he was 100 years old. He was old, he was weak, He's in, he was interviewed and he was crying when he said, I fought for this country, its principles, and many died for it. And now we're losing it all. He's right. We're losing it all. We have watched as mainline denominations have forsaken the truth of the Bible. And they have succumbed to Satan's deceptions of perversion and corruption. And I would have never thought that in my lifetime that I would see even some Baptists who are starting to move in the direction of compromising the truths of God's word. But that's where we're moving to today. It's an alarming, at an alarming rate, and it's alarming to all of us. The debate over the critical race theory has played out in TV studios, uh, um, school board meetings, and state legislators um, uh, across America. Uh, we've seen that. And uh, I would tell you that it's also finding its way into our churches and into our Bible seminaries. It's there in a lot of places, even some of our Baptist churches and Baptist seminaries. CRT is a religion. It's a false religion that's deceptively aimed at destroying Christianity. Satan's behind it all. You've got to watch out. You've got to be careful for it. Let me read to you, it's a long statement, but I think that it gives a good explanation. Dr. John MacArthur um, said um, about CRT. He said, CRT, along with every other Marxist ideology, which that's what it is, cannot be reconciled with what the Bible teaches about sin and salvation. First, to view all relationships in term of power dynamics requires that people be seen in terms of powerful, privileged, and oppressors, and the powerless, the marginalized, the oppressed. Apart from striking out against God-ordained hierarchies and authority structures, 
by evaluating them as a, a oppressive power structures. This way of viewing the world fails to evaluate people in their primary relationship, which is as creatures made in the image of their creator. He who defines the problem gets to define the solution. That is talking about God. He's the one that defines it. If man's main problem for people of color is that they are inevitably oppressed by structures that are inherently oppressive, then the only solution is to tear down those structures in the pursuit of justice. This way of thinking, at the very least, clouds the fact revealed in the Bible that every person's fundamental problem is that they have sinned against the holy God who created them. This is true for people of any and every category, whether oppressed or oppressor, victim or victimizer, marginalized or privileged. The fundamental need, therefore, of every person is to be reconciled to God. That's what we need today. Our government tries to give all these solutions, but we need to be rectified, rectified with God. He goes on to say, this is exactly what has been provided through the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, mankind's greatest need is met in the gospel. And that's the message that we preach. That is the message we continue to preach, that all of our problems, all of our difficulties in our country, uh, in, uh, in the world, it, uh, that mankind's greatest need is met in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He defined it, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we accept that. Vody Bachman said about CRT, he said, it's a religion, but as a religion, it offers no hope. There is no ultimate, re re he goes on to say, there is no ultimate redemption in anti-racism. You just have to do the work of anti-racism for the rest of your life and hope you never step out of line because if you do, then you go back to zero. And he's absolutely right. You know, that's what, what it requires. I said all this to say, I said all that to say this, Satan is working even today to in preparation of the final form of false religion. He's building, he's working in this nation. We're moving toward things in our country we never dreamed that we would move to. I would dare say to you that a lot of people are very ignorant of these things. They're ignorant of what is taking place. Uh, perhaps even some in our congregation that are ignorant of these things. Last week, we spoke about the commencement of the Antichrist as the beast. And today we look at the consolidation of Antichrist as the false prophet. First of all, the false prophet, his person. Let's look at it in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, some believe because this beast is coming out of the earth, you remember the first one came out of the sea, we spoke about last week. This one comes out of the earth. Uh, they, uh, like the first beast, uh, He'll come out from among the common pe people of the earth. Some people think that. Some Bible scholars believe that he will come from the Jewish nation since uh, they are the people of the land of God. And regardless, however, I will tell you that we do know that the, that's all speculation. But we do know that the false prophet is described like a lamb and a dragon. Now, his description as a lamb speaks of his meekness. At first, he'll be uh, soft-spoken, a smooth-talking orator. Uh, he'll be gentle and gracious and uh, uh, appealing to the masses. And on the one hand, he appears to be like Christ. He's meek and he's mild and he's gentle. But the Bible reveals that when he opens his mouth, it will reveal his true nature. He looks like a lamb, but yet he sounds like a dragon, is what the Bible is saying. You see, despite his deceptively mild appearance, the false prophet propagating corrupt religion, uh, he's there representing Antichrist. And it, all, it is always true in totalitarian 
governments that the, the totalitarian rulers seek to use religion in order to enslave the masses of people. If there's anything that you learn in the study of the book of Revelation, it is this, that Satan is always an imitator. I told that to you last week. He's an imitator. And everything that God does, the devil tries to imitate. Revelation chapter 17, it tells us about an imitation. Now I'm going to read uh, so a few portions, a uh, 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 passage of scripture there, verse 3 through 5. And it said, And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stone and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. We're talking about the false church here. In Bible prophecy, a woman, not a man, a woman is a symbol of religion, whether it be good or bad. The true church of the Lord Jesus Christ is called the bride of Christ. The harlot of Revelation 17 is the, the opposite. It's the imitation. It is the anti-church because Antichrist is going to have an anti-church. You see, Satan is, is not against um, is not against religion. Don't think that. Satan's not against religion at all. Many believe this false prophet will give the appearance of the follower uh, uh, as a follower of Jesus Christ. It'll give that appearance. Many Bible scholars think that they will come that way as the Lamb of God, as uh, seemingly like a follower of uh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He'll appear to be one of God's little lambs or sheep. He'll appear to represent peace and love and joy. However, the Bible says his voice will betray him because the beast is going to speak like a dragon. And to be honest with you, to me, I couldn't help but think of, it sounds like prosperity preachers today that are out there. They say things that people love, and the masses flock to them. But hear me when I say to you, I submit to you that the, that the prosperity gospel is not the gospel at all. It's not. It is not the gospel. It's, it's an imitation. It's fooling people. What the false prophet has to say will re reveal that he is not the prophet of God, but that he is a false prophet. And I want to remind you that when Jesus, as we've been going through the book of Matthew, um, we're in the part now of the Sermon on the Mount. I'll pick that back up at the beginning of the new year. We're done with that for the year. We'll pick that back up in January. But we're in the Mount of, uh, we're into the, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount with a very strong warning. His powerful message that he gave. You want me to tell you what he said? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. That's how he ends up, and it's very important. Second of all, we see the false prophet is power. The horns of the lamb speak of power and authority, and the false prophet becomes the chief executive officer of the new regime under the beast. First of all, we see his power is directive because he's powerful. Verse 12, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We talked about that last week, remember? Seemingly like he came back to life, but uh, it's, it's an imitation, I believe. And so this is this statement here is government and religion working together. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36 tells us that the gold of the Antichrist, as Daniel says, is uh, the gold of the Antichrist is to exalt and magnify himself above every god. That's what Daniel says. 
Satan has always wanted to take God's place and to have um, people worship him as God. That's what he has always wanted. He wants to wear God's crown to rule God's kingdom and to sit on God's throne. That's what Satan desires. And Satan is once again here seeking to steal God's glory. And just as the Holy Spirit leads God's people towards Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you that the false prophet will point people to worship the Antichrist. Now, if you look at history, we have seen many times that the political world will marry itself to false religion in order to give uh, itself a mark of a credibility. That's what they will do. And even secular belief systems like communism and socialism and atheism and uh, materialism can't get away from religion. They can't get away from it. You see, you say, well, they're, if they're atheists, there's no religion. No, my friend, their religion is anti-God. That is their religion. Why do you think they get so rattled when you talk to them about atheism or talk about Jesus Christ is because it is a religion. It's an anti-God religion, it, but it, it is a faith syst system nonetheless. I always, get, I always get frustrated when I hear politicians, people will say, he's a man of faith. That doesn't do it for me, friend, because he's a man of faith of what? You know, faith in himself? Faith in the devil or what? Why don't they go ahead and say he's a man of faith in Jesus Christ? That's where I am. I'm a man of faith, but my faith is in Jesus Christ. And I believe that you would say that's true of you today. And so Satan is going to use a false prophet to unite the world with religion to be ruled by the Antichrist. Second of all, his power is deceptive. Verse 13 and 14. He performs great signs so that even that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do so in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So the false prophet will counterfeit God's miracles by calling fire down from heaven. Now, in the Old Testament, calling fire down from heaven was often used to execute God's judgment. You, look, you find it all through the scripture. Fire and brimstone fell down on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19. Fire consumed Aaron's sons when they violated God's commands in Leviticus chapter 10. And fire fell from heaven and consumed Elijah's sacrifice, thus triumphing over uh, the, prophet, the prophets of Baal there in 1 Kings chapter 18. So whatever God does, you can bank on it. Satan is the master counterfeiter. He wants to, to imitate it. And uh, we, all, we have to always keep this in mind. When there is a miracle, now hear me, because this, might, and this is confusing to some Christians. When there is a, a, a miracle that has occurred that seems to be supernatural, in, in nature, we've seen these things, we've heard about them if you've not seen them, we have to ask ourselves, supernatural in what sense? That's very important that we ask that. Is it supernaturally a miracle of God or is it supernaturally a miracle of the devil? Which is it? The devil's able to perform miracles also. Did you know that? If you didn't know that, just think back when Moses went and threw the rod down and it turned into a snake. But what happened with, with uh, Pharaoh's religious leaders that were around, they did the same also. The part I love about that story is Moses' rod, which turned into a snake, ate up all the other snakes. You know, they were fakes, they were phonies. But they were able to do that. You see... The, the very existence of the performance of a miracle does not necessarily mean that it is of God. Remember that. People are gullible to that in our world that we live in. Everything should be checked out by the Word of God. 
And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. And friend, that's even in our day and time. That doesn't, doesn't have to be during the time of tribulation. And the purpose of these miracles which the Antichrist and the false prophet will do during this great tribulation time is for the purpose of deception. The world will engage in the most shocking and blatant idolatry that you've ever seen because the scripture tells us Antichrist, aided by the false prophet, will set up a statue of himself as a symbol of his deity and uh, he wants worldwide worship is what he wants. And this blasphemy image, it's indicated in the scripture that it will be set up somewhere imported in the, the temple area on the grounds there in Jerusalem. It'll be a tribute to the power of the Antichrist who seemingly has power over death, as we talked about last week. Then third of all, his power is destructive in verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Somehow or another, the false prophet will empower this image that they set up there, this big image of the Antichrist, will cause it to speak. Its ability to be able to talk can you imagine if we put a big uh, stone or let's just say gold image up here and all of a sudden it just came alive and started talking. People would fall back. You know, they would be amazed as they saw it. That's what's going to happen here. And, and really, this is not that amazing when you think about it. Um, if it's not done in supernatural power, there's so many things done today. You've been to the Hall of Presidents and seen all the presidents stand up and talk. Have you not? They've been dead a long time. And so the false prophet will either use technology or some form of illusion in order to deceive the people. We know that the master um, illusionist, David Copperfield, seemingly made an, an elephant float in air. You think he really does that? Uh, he, he was on television one time, and, and of course people there live, he had them convinced that he caused the Statue of Liberty to d disappear. You know, he's an illusionist, is what he is. But no matter what the specifics may be, the image is going to seem to be alive and it's going to speak. Then we find the third of all the false prophet is program. It's amazing how many people in this world who who don't even know God, that they've heard about the mark of the beast. And they've heard about um, the number 666, 666. They've heard about it. And they know it's not just a normal number. You know, they know that there's something different about this. They know that there must be something evil about it. But I want you to notice two things about this that we're told in the scripture. The demand of the mark of the beast in verse 16 and 17. He calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, the word mark is synonymous with the word seal. In old days, you know this because you read history, that an emperor would take a signet ring and he would dip it in hot wax and put his seal on a letter to authenticate his contents. And so it is with the mark of the seal of the beast. Remember the false prophet is a counterfeit counterpart of the Holy Spirit. Remember that. You see, just as God's children are sealed, as the Bible tells us, by the Holy Spirit, the devil's children will be branded by the beast. Now, I'm sure that you have noticed that we are quickly moving toward a cashless society. A lot of places won't even use coins anymore. You know, in our area, there are some people sometimes that will tell you that 
they don't take cash. You know, some only take cash because they don't want to do credit card, but there are some places that won't, won't take cash. I've traveled much internationally, you know that, and there are places in the world that don't take cash. You get it on an airplane, they don't take cash. Uh, you know, they, they want a credit card. If you're going to buy anything that they have, they don't give anything to you free anymore. You know that. And uh, you pay for anything you get, and you had to pay for it with a card. You're not going to pay cash, someone said, because too many employees were keeping the cash. But regardless of the reason for it, it is true. According to CheckKeeper blog, it says issuing checks cost an estimated 26 to 54 billion annually. That's what they say. The American Bar Magazine reports that crime would virtually be eliminated if we would become a cashless society. Now, I don't know about that. I think they would try to steal something else, steal the ring off your finger or watch or whatever. But our monetary systems are moving quickly to transform, uh, uh, transferring money uh, electronically. We know this is true. It's allowing business transactions to take place without checks or currency. I would tell you even what's taken place uh, in COVID has moved us more towards that. We have more people that give online now at our church than we have ever had. And I submit to you that churches all across America have more people that give online now uh, rather than giving cash or our check uh, at church. Um, and we're, you know, which is, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It, it's helpful that way. But uh, I'm just saying we're moving towards that. Uh, the technology already exists that would enable us to miniaturize a person's credit profile and put it under their skin with just a laser beam. Uh, it's already there. And it'll be invisible to the eye. But uh, that way, when you go to the grocery store or wherever, you don't take anything with you. I mean, you just can stick your hand out there or whatever. Now, we know that some of these chips are already used in the medical field that has been implanted in people. So, whereas a person might would wear a medical bracelet before, now they have all their information under their skin so that if uh, uh, um, uh, anybody would come into the hospital or wherever, they can immediately know what the medical situation is of this person. In the false prophets program, if you're not marked, you're not going to make it. You see, you'll not be able to buy or sell, and therefore, there's going to be no living for you but dying. Christians in the first century also often had to make a public choice once a year because they were there in the Middle East, and even not further out than that, they had to choose between declaring whether Caesar is Lord or Jesus is Lord. And they were demanded to, to make the statement that Caesar is Lord. And many died because they would not say that Caesar is Lord. In the last days, this kind of persecution is going to be revived. People will again be required to make a public choice. Inspired by Satan, the beast and the false prophet will force people to declare the condition of their ownership. There's going to be no middle ground when that day comes. And why will people take this mark? I'll tell you really three reasons why. Some will take the mark because they are convinced. You see, they will think that the world will be better off under one world government, one world religion. They think things will run smoother under the one commercial center, so they take the mark. Another reason why I would say is some take the mark because they are careless. In other words, they don't care one way or another what the mark means. They don't care. They just go along so they can buy and sell and so they can eat and drink and be merry. That's the only reason why they do. Their whole focus is on the goods of this world. Our third reason, some will take the mark because they're cowards. They're not willing to take a stand uh, uh, alone against the beast and the rest of the world. And they'd rather go to hell with a majority than to be saved and know Jesus Christ with a minority. 
they would rather do that. Then last of all, let's look at the display of the mark of the beast. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, the exclamation, here is wisdom, it is a warning to those alive at the time to be wise and discerning so they can recognize what is happening and understand the significance of this number connected with the Antichrist's name. Many have speculated. They've tried to come up with a number of 666, and I'm not going to take time. I've read a lot of the, uh, and you have too, of speculation of uh, different world leaders in times past and tried to calculate this number the, uh, with them. But I would tell you, theologically, six is a number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. He was told to work six, six days and to rest on the seventh. And seven is the divine number of God, the perfect number. Six is the number of man. So this number that the beast gives is a trinity of sixes. I told you he imitates the Lord. So you've got the trinity there. There's a trinity of sixes, six, six, six. There's even been movies that have been made uh, in the secular world about the number of 666. Great speculation has been given to knowing who the beast will be or the Antichrist if we can just know what this number represents. But I'm telling you today, you're wasting your time if you think you're going to figure out who the Antichrist is by finding the meaning of 666. The church father Arrhenius cautioned us against speculating about the identity of the person associated with this number of 666. But let me put it to you this way as I'm closing in the sermon today. The story was told of Johann Sebastian Bach, the great German composer who happened to be a sound sleeper. In fact, when they wanted his children, wanted to get him up, they would go and play a few measures of some composition and they'd leave off the very last note or chord. They'd play it all and get to the last and they wouldn't play it. He couldn't stand it like a true musician and he had to jump up and run in there and hit that last note or last chord on the piano. Six, especially 666, reminds us that there is something missing Seven is the number of completion. Six, there's something that's incomplete. And so I would tell you, a man whose number is 666 will arise on the world stage for a, short, uh, for a few short moments before facing God's judgment. And like a song without a final note, I'm telling you, neither the false prophet nor the antichrist can bring history to a final closure. Only the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, can do that. He's the only one. He is the perfect seven as we all uh, uh, who find refuge in him for eternity. He is the perfect one. And I'm glad that the revelation that we've been talking about in chapter 13 today, that's not the end. As we turn on in the pages of prophecy, We'll soon move away from the number of man and we will see the perfect seven, the seven-horned Lamb of God. And we who know Christ will enjoy the presence of our perfect Savior living in a blessed new world. Thank God. That's the exciting thing of this message. We will sing the sevenfold doxology of dominion and glory and power and honor unto him that lives forever and ever, forevermore. And our perfection, our victory, our new world, our ultimate and final government, and our marvelous salvation, these are all in the Lamb of God, the perfect seven. It's finally coming. I would say to you, thank God, there is a tremendous difference between the beast and the lamb. 
The beast will give you a number. The lamb gives you a name. The saints of God who have rejected the lies of the false prophet, let me go back and tell you that their blood will run in the streets. The false prophet will have them killed, and it'll all be done. Hear me now. This is the point of my whole message. It'll all be done in the name of religion. It'll be done in the name of religion. Now, that should not surprise us. You want me to tell you the reason why? Jesus was crucified in the name of religion. You remember the apostle Paul, when he was Saul, was instrumental in having many Christians put to death in the name of religion. There have been literally millions of people, born-again Christians, that have been murdered down through the history of time in the name of religion. One man was talking to a Christian about the importance of merely having religion. The man said, after all, all, re all religions have some good in them. He's trying to make a point, you know, just need to have religion. All religions have some good in them. The Christian said back to him, so has rat poison. It is 80, it is 98% cornmeal, but the other 2% is enough poison to kill. And he's absolutely right. I'm not going to deny to you today that there's some good in all religion. Really, there are a lot of religions that teach a lot of good things of how for people to live. But let me remind you, religion kills. That's an important message today. Religion kills. But remember, true Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. It is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I know this is a scary message, but it is a message that is gaining new urgency and new relevance each passing day. The longer we live, I'm already seeing things that I never dreamed that I'd see in my lifetime, of things that are transpiring that are fitting right in with prophecy. And that's why it's imperative today that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. It's important. It is the Spirit of God that gives life. Religion and ritualism will not save you. And I look at people in America that go to church every Sunday and they're depending on religion and ritualism to save them. And it will not save them. Only Jesus Christ can save a man from his sins. Do you know Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior? God loves everyone. We're all sinners, the Bible says. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Would you call upon him today to be your Lord and Savior?